Welcome to Waiting on the Trade, a comics book club for people who can't keep up with monthly comics. I'm Matt Ledger. I'm Patrick Fitzgerald Fleck. And I'm Catherine Prince. This month we're talking about Next Wave, Agents of Hate, a 12-issue series by Stuart Immonen, Wade Von Grabadger, and several other people, including, yes, unfortunately, Warren Ellis. Now, in case you need a refresher, Next Wave is the story of five B-list Marvel superheroes facing off against a variety of sci-fi and mystical madness. There's punching, snark, explosions, and so, so, so many shitty men. As the series reaches its conclusions, our heroes finally dismantle the Evil Beyond Corporation. Or have they? <laughs> Catherine has typed butts into the Google document, and I think that's actually how I feel about it. <laughs> Curly. Cat. Welcome back to the podcast. Oh, I got her right when she started coughing with the bronchitis. Uh-huh. Oh, can we not just like announce that to your podcast? That'd be great. A HIPAA oh, violation yeah. within the first three minutes? Come on. I did not I'm give not her a doctor. <laughs> <laughs> I was actually going to say that Kat and I are both coming off of a, a bout of uh, coughing and sickness. So the the discussion and audio may not be up to its usual quality and it's everyone's fault except Pat. <laughs> no man, don't admit it. Just like people will be like, oh there's something wrong with my audio. They sound like gross. <laughs> they sound gross that their ideas are incoherent. <laughs> <laughs> What's wrong it with my iPhone? <laughs> probably, yeah, my headphone jack isn't quite right. <laughs> Anyways, Kat, I was saying, welcome back to the podcast. Thank you. You finally got to pick and read a non-saga book again, which was not forced upon you. How That's... does it feel to have freedom <laughs> of choice? <laughs> it's been a few years since this has happened. Uh, I'm not really sure. Not... Like should, should we just talk years. about saga anyway? We can. Sure. <laughs> I honestly might prefer it. <laughs> hey, I picked this book. <laughs> no, we're going to have a good discussion about this book, actually. I think, um, like... Like I said in our text message chain before we started, like the three questions we submitted really fit together neatly in my head, and I think they'll take us to a lot of interesting places. So <laughs> I think it'll be a good one, actually. Mm. So the so the questions do fit together neatly in my head, and I think that we should just get in there and start tackling them then. And I think it makes sense for us to start with your question first, Kat, because I think it's going to be the majority of the discussion. And I think it also influences my answer to Pat's question. <laughs> it's been a while since I've discussed anything that is not saga with y'all. I, don't you like start with a a brief overview of what this is? No, not really. I mean, we did it. Now, in case you need a refresher, oh. <laughs> Pat's highlighting it in the Google document right now. I okay. mean, I can, okay. No, I I'll, I'll I'll do it. We don't need a script. I shall read we from the back. We literally have a script, and we're at the part where the yeah. discussion <laughs> question is. Oh. <laughs> we're no, you're not. Yeah. Wait, did you say that other... Oh, that's right! I wrote butts right there! I wasn't listening because oh I was waiting God. for you to get the butts. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, I apologize. Gonna... So yeah, you're right. We are at the part in your script where it says discussion questions. I've done it. I'm just so taking a screenshot of the current state of the script so I can put <laughs> it in the show notes I got. <laughs> Well, because I had a little bit of a lead up to it in terms of like what I was thinking about when I framed this question, which is sure. essentially at its heart a, a, a cancel cu- culture question. Well, I mean, I guess to be fair, we could introduce it like we've done so many in the past. Kat, how did you get introduced to Next Wave originally? I was going to try to say that about three times before, before I got rolled over by you didn't introduce it. <laughs> but then you didn't say it. So that's yeah. true. Yeah. Got, got. <laughs> Well, the the quick answer to that is, I don't know how this happened. <laughs> um, I, like, it came out originally in, like, what, 2005, 6, 7? 7, yeah. 7? Yeah. So, probably a few years following that, I don't know, two, 2009, 2010. I would imagine through Matt, because... Uh, as all is, things flow, yes. Is well, this isn't flow, one yeah. that I would just be like, yeah, superheroes and pick up. Just like from the outside, it looks like one of the types of comics I'm not that interested in. Yeah, sure. it's a, um, it's a superhero team of superheroes wants to really in the Marvel it. Universe. It's, it's not for you, probably, you would think, except maybe it is. Honestly, rereading this, I think I missed 
majority of the parody in this, which is ridiculous because it's all parody. No, yeah. there's so much parody. <laughs> <laughs> parody of what? Because I haven't read any of the source material. I've seen yeah, some movies. So, like, there's parody of, like, kind of this moment in superhero comics, which is, like, widescreen action and, like, heroes getting, like, grittier and, like, revamped origins and stuff. And, like, that's part of what's going on with the new Paramounts at the end is, like, they're a take on the Ultimates, which was, like, a a different continuity version of the Avengers that kind of influenced the movies. But in the same way that like kind of all of the heroes in this book are at least slightly shitty, like all of the heroes in the ultimates are like at least slightly shitty. So, and I guess this is the same era in which the boys was originally being published too, which is, um, I guess the grittier take on what if superheroes were real, they would be just as shitty as real people. Yeah, were we're starting to like deal with the deconstruction of the superhero as a moral person a lot. Which I do like. Era. That is a thing that I like. <laughs> I mean, I know you know that uh, I don't. So. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, so one more thing on the parody before we move on, like there's straight up a moment in the Ultimates where Ultimate Captain America, who is a big ol' American dickhead, um, like kicks over. Oh my god, he kicks over like a Muslim guy who's on this opposing like mm. super team, and is just like, "Do you think this A on my head stands, stands for France?" For France yeah. And that's what Elsa Bloodstone's parodying when she like it goes, "Victim, victim." Do you think this letter on my chest stands for America? Like it's uh, straight up a parody of that moment. And it's pre pre Brexit T shirt. Right, yeah. That one is still funny to me, actually. I was kind of wondering, what is she doing wandering around in this t-shirt? Like, that's not her. It's all set up for that joke. Uh... <laughs> Which, if you know what it's referencing, is a good joke. And if you don't know what it's referencing, I think it's still an okay joke. It was still an okay joke. Yeah. I did not. I don't know any of the parodies, really. Yeah. I mean, we're going to talk about whether this book is held up or not. The Ultimates is not a book that is held up, which... <laughs> That's a different discussion. A though. different discussion for someone who is not me. Yes. Um, anyways, <laughs> I would imagine you were introduced to this book through me. I can't remember whether this is one that Cal recommended to me or I had just found, honestly. But like, this is part of I think my expansion out of just mainstream superhero stuff to like slightly uh, like more obscure or irreverent or like not just straightforward stuff. So that's probably how we found it well the <laughs> reason it. i picked it is because of late i've been doing some well a fair few how has it aged explorations of things that i remember liking that came out in about you know like the late noughties um so like for this one 2007 and some of them have held up and some of them have not um which we can discuss later perhaps yeah we'll get into it for sure but <clears throat> but okay so Long story short, this is written by uh, Warren Ellis, who in recent years, it has come to light that he has been guilty of things like sexual coercion, grooming, and emotional abuse of about 100 women. The women even have their own website, so many of us.com, uh, which is honestly surprising for a guy that looks like a potato in a hat. So I guess <laughs> that's something. Um, yeah, so my question was about, because I've been thinking about cancel culture as it relates to comics. Um, this is something Matt's been doing a little bit too, where um, he did not want to reread Next Wave because he did not want to read a Warren Ellis book. But I remember liking it, so I was like, no, we're doing it. So yeah, cancel culture as it relates to comics. It's kind of more of a, um, exploration of where to draw the line. So as consumers of media, we can use our power to not consume, to send a message, but this isn't just Warren Ellis's book. Like Stuart Immonen, the artist, does not appear to have a group of women he has victimized to the point that they've started their own website. You know, he's probably an upstanding guy. And then what about the colorist? What about the letterer, the editor, the associate managing editor? So when we leverage our power as consumers, is it different for past works from a bad seed versus ongoing future works? Basically, like, comics are really collaborative. So what do you think um, cancel culture's implications are in this particular medium? 
especially for something that's come out such a long time ago. Yeah, I mean, I can go first as I as I very often do. <laughs> but um, I guess so. Like this, the Warren Ellis stuff came out basically during that pandemic summer where like so many people were kind of like outed as being creeps in the same summer because everyone was just on social media saying like saying hey no this person's a creep um and like there were several comics people during that same summer i don't know if like cameron stewart was that summer or earlier like jason latour was that summer for sure because that's when i got rid of my copies of southern bastards um like and i was buying at the time actually the single issues of the batman's grave which is another warren ellis book that he actually did with ultimates artist brian hitch which is kind of funny so like i just stopped buying that because i was like i don't want to put money in this guy's pocket but like at the same time i own so many war like i own a lot of warren ellis books at the time oh maybe i don't actually own that many but like i still have planetary on the shelf that's a warren ellis series i really like that series and like in the way that this book is really kind of like not super optimistic like everyone's kind of snarky and mean like everyone's always snarky in warren ellis comics it's just kind of his thing but like that's a book that has a lot to say about how storytelling and pop culture tropes and everything have changed over time and is also like a very optimistic book at the end and like it's good (laughs) so like i have that one still and i'm not sure i should like i've considered getting rid of it a few times and I don't know what to do about it. So, and it's a weird one because, like, you were talking, Cat, about the collaborative nature of comics. That book has, I think, both John Cassidy and Laura Martin on uh, art and colors. And that same team is on Astonishing X Men with Joss Whedon, which is another series that I'm like, oh, God, do I have to get rid of this one? Because Joss Whedon was also revealed to be a creep, I think, during the Summer of Creeps, if not before or after. Like, Oh There's... my god, you, if you get rid of all the Joss Whedon stuff, that's like half of modern pop culture. It's a lot, right? Yeah. And like there is something to be said for like some of that stuff, like a lot of other people worked on that stuff too, right? Like Joss Whedon wrote like four episodes of Buffy per season or something, right? He didn't write all of them, like that's not how TV works. So like are you throwing out all of Buffy the Vampire Slayer? Are you throwing okay, but... out just the Joss ones? Like... But there's a difference, like when you're talking about people and acknowledging some of these uh, misbehaviors is one thing. Not choosing to purchase new things is another thing. And then deciding whether or not to keep some stuff that you already have that's probably more of a personal decision and it doesn't really affect the creators that much. If you're like, well, I'll just give this to Goodwill or I guess if you really don't want anyone to be able to read it because you don't like them, then I guess you will throw it away or burn it or something. Yeah. I mean, a little dramatic. No, I think I agree. No, I did actually, I don't know if you remember this cat. I threw away that print that I bought at the, yes, I um, remember. the magic fest in Vegas that we went to. Cause it was by an artist who was also revealed to be like a sexual coercion creep for magic. And I was like, I like, that one was a personal choice because I had it over my desk and it's like, I can't look at this without thinking about this creep. I got to get rid of this thing. So it's gone. Like, that's the thing. Like, and I think with a comic, it is different because like I look at planetary on my shelf and I'm like, a lot of what I think about is like the John Cassidy art. Like, it's very good. Uh, I look at astonishing on my shelf and like, again, the art, but also those characters are much like, Cyclops is larger than Joss Whedon in my brain, if that makes sense. So, like, that plays into it a little bit. Well, here's the thing about Next Wave. Like, yes, people are kind of snarky and mean to each other. And there's some, like, kind of rapey moments in there, too. Mm. Like, oh, women are objectified there a lot. Are. That guy that's like, oh, maybe I'll get 10 minutes alone with Ava Brown. Like, oof. Okay. So, I mean, it definitely has that horn dog frat boy brand of humor that was so popular, at least in movies at the time. But, you know, given all that stop staring at my chest and you're too old for me one-liners, I don't find it surprising that Next Wave was written by a guy with a certain disregard for women. So, like, if you read it knowing that going in, it's, it's not exactly a shocker. No, but I think it does actually make the act of reading Next Wave worse because... Every time I read about a dude doing shitty stuff in Next Wave, I'm just like, oh yeah, the guy who wrote this is a shitty dude. 
like so it, it's a it's like a little ping in the back of my mind everything every time that like Dirk Anger talks about how he had to like kill his wife because she stopped being interesting to him or whatever, right? I'm like, oh, I, that that's I not good. Though so that fits with his character. I mean, but like, so everything that a writer writes comes from somewhere, right? Like, it doesn't have to be an exact thing that they feel or did, but like, it's a thing that's in their brain somewhere, and it's like, okay, so how much of that is? Like a transpilation, I don't even know that's the right word, or is a word. Transpilation? You just made Transpilation. that up. Transpilation. All right, now I'm looking it up. Anyways, Pat, Pat, hasn't, Pat hasn't talked yet, so I want Pat to get into his feelings on it. Also, will I look up whether transpilation's a word? It's not. Yeah. I don't think. So there's that. <laughs> there's someone on prosy.com that says transpilation in English is a new coinage with a very specific mathematical meaning. Uh, that's probably not what I was trying to say. So <laughs> I'm going to blame the sick brain on that one. But Pat, okay. you haven't talked right. yet. Walk me through your your opinion on on these questions. I really with a lot of questions, honestly. I've had to struggle with this for a while because while Next Wave I've enjoyed in the past, it certainly hasn't been one of my favorites. But like you guys were saying, Joss Whedon has had his own issues, and like Firefly was one of like one of my favorite pieces of science fiction TV Western stuff. It's awesome. Nathan Fillion is the man, but a lot of the interactions between characters and that, not great <laughs> on second viewing. Oh, like what? I, really? It's been a while for me. I mean, just the whole companion character. What? There's a whole scene where I got I should look up what the character's name is at this point. It's been a while since I've watched it. In Inara? Anara, yeah. So there's a character who's literally she's a prostitute. She's a sex worker. She's a sex worker. Yeah. And it's a legitimate career in that society. But Nathan Fillion's character legit calls her a whore. She tells him not to, and he still does it. And it's never really resolved. It's like it, there's some ickiness there if you really want to go back and re-watch it yeah but i mean he's not in the right right like no but i like he's doing it specifically to be nasty and he knows it yeah it's it doesn't feel great with what news i mean it's not as no, bad I, mean, I do see what but, you're saying though i think it's the same thing i was talking about with when like st like stuff against women comes up against in next wave too or just like it kind of just like pings your brain and you're like oh yeah that's right no good. can i just say i was really impressed with the way prostitution was depicted in firefly yeah i, I think on the like, whole yeah idealized world uh i mean i guess the real issue is when you start looking at like dollhouse which the very concept of it to begin with when i first got into it was sort of like whoa this is treading a fine line yeah of that's using that using attractive people's bodies for it's just it's it's showbiz yeah <laughs> the nfl but, <laughs> the nfl yeah i guess it's still very much a part of mainstream culture yeah but yeah so that and then what we've got what was it i just had it and i forgot the name of the D D comic book ask characters all female rat oh, uh, queens rat there we yeah. go oh yeah, oh, yeah. Rat queens. worked it out there were some problems with the writer on that is that correct uh, that's one that i don't remember either because like we had read two volumes of that and then we found whatever that was out and we we're like yeah it's fine like that one yeah. i was not super invested in so that made that decision very easy i mean i enjoyed it i haven't read past volume two because things fell apart and I mean, like you've got Kevin Spacey doing Kevin Spacey things. And does that taint everything that he's been in, in the past? I don't know. Yeah. Possibly. I mean, I think, like Kat was saying, like the, the past works, especially, I think you're going to like, everyone's going to have their own line. Yeah. And like, it might be a weird line. It might be a weird line that comes in, like based on again, like, the the astonishing x-men stuff for me really does get more of a pass because those characters have existed prior to joss taking them on and will continue to exist far into the future mm -hmm. right like they're also not of next wave his. characters i mean that's actually partially mm -hmm. a thing too like 
I <laughs> so like Monica, I like in stuff prior to this, which actually makes some of her weird flashbacks grating for me. But we'll talk about that, I think. Um, and I like Monica and stuff after this too. Like so, and Next Wave actually kind of is incorporated as part of her history at this point. Like in the introduction mm. that you didn't listen to, Cat, I said. <laughs> dismantle the evil beyond corporation or have they turns out they didn't <laughs> turns out the beyond not. corporation still exists and like part of monica's deal now is that she's one of the people who knows that the beyond corporation exists so she deals with it so like every once in a while other people will be drawn into that like web and also monica's off doing other stuff too so well i think but, for me the war and alice issue isn't an issue like isn't really a problem for me to drop or not pick up war and alice comics because other than this i don't think i've re- i mean is preacher born of us no so, that's uh garth ennis, garth ennis. <laughs> in, in i know they all have of, such similar names gosh dang it it's in the cycle of three that cat confuses all the time yeah, Grant <laughs> yeah. is the other one by the way cat <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah but Graham, they're great Graham Morris is fine yeah it's just they have such similar names that sure sure, sure. We have but like other than the next wave i don't know if i've got any kind of investment in any other Warren Ellis properties. I probably do. The guy is pretty prolific. So, but Have you watched Castlevania, the Netflix series. Oh, I guess that's okay. true. I mean, I did watch it, but it's not as great as everyone says it is. I'll just say that yeah, the animation's true. great. The, the quality of the show is top notch story. Sort of me. I watched, I have the same opinion, but <laughs> neither here nor there. So the copy that, that Matt and I read is from the library and I feel like I don't yeah. care. Like me reading this as a library book is not putting any money well into any of the creators pockets, but like, mm-hmm. yeah, I guess <clears throat> if you think about it as like making a statement fiscally by not choosing to purchase things from a specific creator, that would be forward, you know, future facing and then stuff they've already done. I'd say, like, yeah, sure, just with a grain of salt. And then if you don't like it, maybe that's why. Sure. So I will say, Kat, that first off, like, the... So there's that... I was talking about that, the Batman's Grave series that I dropped in the middle of the pandemic because all the War and Ellis stuff came out, and I was like, I don't need to deal with this. Like, I don't need to finish this story. It's Sounds not extremely it melodramatic anyway. <laughs> just no, it's, I had stopped buying a comic. Woot, woot. Yay, I... I'm such a great feminist. Woo. <laughs> right. But like, I, I did choose to do the thing and they had the collection at the library. Um, that's like down the street from us. And I was like, well, if I check that out, it does say like, I checked that out. Someone's interested in this. Like potentially they purchase another copy at some point. If enough people check it out again, doesn't matter. It's like a 0.001 percentage thing or whatever, but like, I didn't check it out. Until we read this one, because I was like, well, if I'm doing one, I'll just do the other one while I'm doing it. Also, that series ended up, ends up being bad for anyone else who fell off of it for the same reason. Like, don't bother going to go pick it up or get it from your library. It's not great. But yeah, so there is like, there is like a small smidgen of like something that we, that we have done by checking it out from the library. It's, it's basically nothing, but it is a thing. And second, like, we never will, as far as I'm concerned, at least, own a copy of Next Wave again. Like, we did own one. I think I sent that copy to Cal, so maybe this wasn't a Cal recommendation now that I think about it. Um, and, like, just never rebought it. And we never will, because, like, I just don't, like, I don't feel the need. And, like, Stuart Eminen's, like, one of my favorite artists, too. So that kind of sucks <laughs> for Stuart Eminen that, like, people are going to not buy Next Wave going into the future because of this. Well, like, I'm one sure there person. Are- no, I'm sure there are other people, though. I'm not saying my choice is the choice everyone will make, but there are people that will make the same choice for the same reason. And, like, Stuart Eminem's wallet takes a hit because of that. I think, actually, about the time this stuff came out, there was an artist, Ramon Villalobos, who was slated to work on, like, the next Warren Ellis series at DC, and DC just was like, no, fuck, we're gonna punt that. And then, like, Ramon Villalobos, like, didn't get work for a while after that, because, like, was four, was, like, was four issues into the can on a project, and then the project got canceled, and then, like, had to go, like, trying to get work together, and it was the middle of the pandemic. So, like... (laughs) Yeah. You know, I think this would be a really interesting thing for an economist to study, like, what the the far-reaching and more targeted effects of choosing to avoid a specific creator actually does like does it actually matter 
I think maybe it's a thing that will eventually blow over and Warren Ellis will be writing a lot of stuff. Maybe here it is. I mean, I don't think it's a lot of stuff. Actually, when it was not that far after everything blew up, it was maybe like a year and change or something. I think maybe find this for the show notes. Um, Image announced like a new Warren Ellis series. And they got such backlash, like, mm. so fast. Bell? That Is like, it the oh, Fell series? Uh, maybe? It might be, yeah. Uh, I would have to See, double See, that's where the power lies. If they keep trying to do the same thing again, you're like, no, shut it down. What's already out there is out there. I mean, I don't think there's... I Again, I'll have to double check this for the show notes, but, like, I don't think there's been a new Warren Ellis series since this happened, but I am not sure, and I could be wrong, so... Yeah, I don't really know what the answer is. Uh, it's not fair for any of the other collaborators, for sure, to be completely up, put out of work and for their work not to get the notoriety that it deserves. I've... So I guess, like, Kat, kind of turning this back to you so that you can talk about the question a little bit, too. Like, are you more likely to buy someone like... You'll just have to go with my hypothetical here. I know you're probably not likely to do either of these, but walk with me. Yes, and wow. with me, please. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, are you more likely to buy someone like a Series 1 Buffy DVD? Because that was not just Joss Whedon like, wrote a thing. It's like a whole show and ensemble and like a bunch of people worked on it and there's a lot, like, a lot going on there. Or would you be more likely to buy like a Harry Potter Volume 1 and give it to someone because... It's it's that good that it overcomes the fact that J.K. Rowling, the person, is not great, <laughs> it seems like. I mean, like, there's probably 500 Harry Potters in every square mile of this city, so... Well, I asked you to yes <laughs> and with me. You didn't yes <laughs> and with me. <laughs> I mean... I guess, so I'm trying to ask you, like, does the fact that Buffy is a, made by a collaborative unit of people offset the, fe- like... Oh, and you think Harry Potter isn't? It's, what I mean, about not, the editors and the art? Every country has different art for those. But it's not in the same way, right? Like it's, it's not, not in the same. It's not way. the same thing. I would say, you know what? It's in the past. I love Harry Potter, and I love well the first few seasons of Buffy, um, and I would recommend those to anyone. Like regardless, like I really try to know as little as possible about the creators of things, honestly, because I hate it when this stuff happens. So, like, am I going to give money to J.K. Rowling by playing the new Harry Potter game online? No, probably not. Am I going to forswear Harry Potter and not recommend it to anyone? No, I think it was a really great story and continues to be. (laughs) It just takes a little bit of extra bandwidth now to kind of filter out the parts that are unfortunate about the author. See, my take on that part of the question, actually, is that there's no, like, dearth of good stuff out there. So if you're going to give someone something like that, or, like, you're going to pick something up, you could give the money to a good person, or, like, a better person, right? Like, and I know that's a, a hard These take, are things maybe, that came but... out in the 90s. Like, I, I she's still making money, money but... on it, though. Like, if you buy it, J.K. Rowling gets money. Whereas if you From give a someone... second secondhand bookstore? I mean... I guess not. I'm not sure that's true. That secondhand bookstore then gets in another copy of Harry Potter from somewhere. Like, it it came from the chain (laughs) somewhere, man. Harry Potter is such a massive commercial success that it, like, that wouldn't matter. I think for stuff like that, where it's, like, cultural touchstones that have been, like, really meaningful to a lot of people, and honestly, my choosing not to buy a copy of a book that was published in 1998 would make zero, like, fiscal difference to the creator of harry potter or buying a dvd which people still watch i guess like that wouldn't matter to joss whedon either like that i think is not where cancel culture would really have its strengths it would be like not condoning whatever nonsense jk rowling is saying on twitter or just like I don't know how it would relate to Joss Whedon. Maybe like being aware of new things and keeping an eye on that sort of thing. And if I, I just don't think stuff that's that old and that I really enjoyed at the time and actually has held up. Both of those things have passed the held up test that I would, I'm not going to be like, no, I'm cutting that out of my life because I just don't think that's like, it's not helpful to any, anyone. Yeah. And I mean, I do think there is something to be said for being able to separate the that's story the from the person too. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like, mm-hmm. Again, I think that's why Planetary is still on my shelf, is because I really like that story. And even though it was written by a person that I don't really like anymore, <laughs> like it's yeah. still a good story. So 
I mean, another one that bothers me, and I am a super fan of his works, and it's nowhere near, it's not anything comparable to Warren Ellis's skeeviness, but Brandon Sanderson is a member of the Mormon church. And as one, as a Mormon, he gives 10% of his income to the Mormon church. That's a lot of money, man. (laughs) It is. And it is his money and he can do with it, whatever he wants. But I don't agree with Mormon church on a few things. And, but I love Brandon Sanderson's works. I have bought all of his books. I've supported his latest Kickstarter. I got second of four books that he's sending out. So I, but like somewhere inside of me, it sort of bugs me that, well, some of that money is going to a entity that is working against people that should have freedoms that they don't think they should. Like it's, I don't know what to do. By the same token though, if he's a member of the Mormon church and I assume he probably grew up in it. I don't know how many people like transfer to it. Like it's probably shaped who he is. And would you like him as much if he hadn't grown up in the Mormon church? Like it's hard to piece these things apart. Sure. I think I'd rather have the Mormon church get money than like Tyson or some giant corporation. I I mean, sure. The choices are paralyzing. You, every time you go to the grocery store, every time you go to a, a hardware store, like it's it's everywhere. It's hard to you oh, just good place draw your there. own personal <laughs> line, and it's different for everybody. Yeah, I guess. I mean, like the other thing for Sanderson too is that I think his personal morals do not exactly even align with his church. No, so he said that he wants weird. to change. He wants to change the church from the inside, which is. A great goal, and I'm glad that he feels that way and thinks that he can sway his community to to change their minds on stuff. But until that change is made in, like, the higher-up controlling powers of the church, they're still advocating against, like, I don't know. And, yeah, you can't, like, it'll drive you crazy, like Kat says, if you start to really (laughs) analyze everything, because... Who knows? That person that drew that beautiful landscape kicked a dog last week. Who knows? <laughs> I mean, yeah, do we also have to account for the possibility that people can be shitty and can potentially change also? Like, I know right. Brandon Sanderson's beliefs when he started writing are not the same beliefs that he has now from, like, exactly. from a couple of the articles I've read. And, like, I know Warren Ellis wrote an apology like note and is trying it to, like... It was not accepted. It was not enough was say, according they, to the website that I was looking at. Yeah, I remember that also, and I haven't kept up with that since to keep track of any new developments. And maybe, oh, I don't know. I'd... I just looked at it before we recorded to see what the deal was there. I didn't even know. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, I mean, I don't. I don't know. I have no idea if there's like sure. any actual meaningful change on that front or not. And I don't think it matters a ton to the rest of the discussion we just had. But I think it's worth acknowledging that like people can also change to not be shitty. Hopefully. <laughs> Yeah, I think the main power here is future facing. Like, if someone's continuing to be shitty, boycott their stuff. If they've actually made some meaningful changes in their lives and they seem like they're upstanding citizens or whatever, then encourage that. But, like, what's in the past is done. And it just might be personally tainted for you. Sure. Can I seg here for a minute? So, yeah. seg away. With Next Wave, um, Everyone's mean to each other basically all the time, which I think was funnier to me uh, 10 years ago. (laughs) There's like uh, Steven Universe and stuff like that have come out and it's like, oh my God, I didn't even know this level of wholesome was possible. (laughs) (laughs) I think we're moseying towards Pat's question, actually. So we may want to just dive right in. But I have my thing. She's segging. She's been seg. You cut up my seg. I'm sorry. Keep segging. Okay. Keep, keep segging away. <laughs> so everyone's mean to each other all the time. And it kind of graded on me a little bit because the constant snotty comments like, yeah, they're kind of funny, but they started to get old. But there's one thing I've seen, and it's, I think, only ever one thing I've seen that pulls off horrible people being horrible to each other. And that is Arrested Development, the original three seasons. And they do it spectacularly well. And I'm just, I'm wondering what is missing in this formula that this doesn't quite get there. 
it's the fact that people have to have redeeming moments every once in a while. I was actually just talking about this yesterday at our at our nerd fest day with um our friend Simon who's on the podcast every once in a while because we were talking about how the first 3 seasons of Arrested Development hold up and the 4th season is not good. And part we of it is well, I mean Part of it is that they had to film it with everyone separated so people couldn't even be in the same scene. Like, you definitely feel it. But the other part is that, like, in every... I think maybe because it was on network television at the time? I don't know exactly. But, like, in every episode of Arrested Development, at least Michael Bluth, and usually the other characters, too, like, they're shitty, and they're kind of shitty to each other, and, like, it's bad, and there's conflict. But, like, there's redeeming moments where you recognize that they're people, and... They are actually trying, like like here and there at least. Like they are trying. Yeah, I guess it, Michael Bluth is the straight man, and in this maybe Monica Rambo would come the closest. Yeah, I was yeah. I would say so. For sure. So like there's no like there's no re- there's not really redeeming moments in here. There's not really like, oh, you recognize that this person is actually a good person because everyone's just snarky all the time. I think is where it it breaks. Like, there's no, oh, George Michael, I'll try to be better next time. Or like, oh, Dad, we just had a misunderstanding. It's okay. It's just like, we kind of, we're coworkers and we kind of like each other, but really we're just mean to each other. Well, I'll say, like, I read a little bit of an interview by Warren Ellis, and he said that was by design. Like, there's no character development and he didn't want there to be. It just goes hard and then... I mean, there's a little, like, snippet at the end of the mindless ones adventure where they like it's a caption it's like one character even had something approaching a character moment you can be sure as shit that will happen again right like (laughs) yeah it's the i mean it's supposed to be like punchy explodey action comics like zany sci-fi over the top concept adventures right like it's not supposed to be i mean it's it's breaking a lot of superhero comic rules and actually i've written about this a decent amount on the blog like part of why i like superhero universes and like stuff like the justice league is that yes they go and they fight crime and they stop like they have good like big adventures but like they're friends at the end of the day like they have chili cookouts they have thanksgiving dinners where the justice league meets up with the justice society and they're like friends and like uh mr terrific's playing chess against three justice league members at once and beating them all like Stuff like that where they're actually friendly towards each other. And this comic is not that. This is the anti-that, almost. I don't really want to see them play chess with each other. I mean, I know you don't, <laughs> but I do. <laughs> I <hate> this one. <laughs> All right. So, now that we've had my seg, we can veer it on towards what you were going to say. No, I was just saying, we've, we've kind of been dancing around the question of, like, has the book held up? Which is why you wanted to come to it in the first place. And Pat kind of had the same question. Right, Pat? Yeah. I will rephrase what you just said by saying, has the comedy of Next Wave held up for you guys? For me, for me, it's been, I want to say, six years, maybe more, since I've read this. Uh, and yeah, it didn't tickle me quite as much this time around, probably because of in the light of Warren Ellis's indiscretions, I gave a new flavor to some of the jokes. But... <laughs> It's a lot more immature than I remember. Yeah, which is when fine. Kat, when Kat describes like, it as about, like the frat boy humor comic, I'm like, oh yeah, that's a yeah. Great like, what else was coming out in 2007? It was like Wedding Crashers, maybe the 40 year old virgin. Sure. The thing with Will Ferrell where he's Frank the Tank. The the I don't remember what that's called. With you're my can boy. I tell you, can I tell you what I went for first in my brain? And I typed it in and was like, oh okay, yep, that makes sense. Super bad came out in two thousand seven. Mm, Superman, yeah. super bad. Co- uh, oh, super! Yes, this is exactly. It was just like this whole chain of movies that was like, "Are you a twenty three year old man? You'll love this." And this one is like, it's got ladies one of those. And, and it references. was just like, it was the zeitgeist right then. So you're like, "Ha ha, yeah!" This is just like everything else. And now with maybe more of a frame of reference, you're like, "Yeah, okay." <laughs> Yeah, not so much. And I mean, I think, again, we were kind of talking about this earlier, like the fact that the culture itself, I feel like, has gotten so good at like exposing people for being shitty means that when characters are shitty in media, I kind of just don't have time for it. I'm much more in for the like the Steven Universe or my love story wholesomeness at this point than I'm in for, 
Oh, we're all just dicks to each other. Because, like, there are enough dicks in real life. I don't need to read about this in fiction. Sure. Yeah. I don't, like... I still enjoy the Fing Fang Foom stuff, but I certainly didn't remember like the introduction about mommy was a slut lizard that did the bad thing with suggestively shaped yeah, pipes of nuclear waste. Like, oh, bad for Fing Fang Foom. Just it like, okay, that was slut. just I mean, unnecessary. Like, come on, yeah, man. Just like, we're just like, we're being denigrating for no reason. Here. Being really edgy. Like, I'm not, I don't really care about the honor of Fing Fang Foom's mother, but still, like... The joke about him shoving people in his pants because he's super horny and doesn't have any genitals, that's still funny. No, it's Didn't not need to go. Though. It's not funny. Fin Fang Foom's an incel, man. Yeah, it's funny. It's not funny anymore, no, I still actually. think it's funny. Uh, he doesn't have the hat. <laughs> he's got purple underpants instead. Uh, the Fin Fang Foom stuff was actually like very heartbreaking this time in a way that because like I guess I'm a, an easy marker like a softy now, but like I just I don't, don't think like I cared as much. Mean to animals. I yeah, mean, when I his mean, heart's breaking, that's pretty sad. Aww. When his heart is literally outside his body because he threw it up. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's no good. It's not good anymore. I don't know. I mean, and like the character of Dirk Anger. I thought was funnier towards the beginning than towards the end. <laughs> towards the end, they really just like have him go absolutely insane. Why was he a zombie? Like he's only in like half a scene. The, he's in zombie one Marvel. And a half panels. No, it, Marvel that, loves their zombie. Is that the only that, reason? I wonder if that was actually when Marvel Zombies came out. Hang on. I would imagine. <laughs> like, why else would he come back hey, as a news, zombie? Marvel Zombies wrapped up in April of 2006. So they probably just put a zombie in it, Kat, because there was a Marvel Zombies miniseries that was very popular at the time. <laughs> but, like, just the idea of Dirk Anger being a stand-in for Nick Fury was pretty funny. And, like, <laughs> the flying giant submarine instead of a flying, uh, what is it called? The helicarrier. Yeah. 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 Just, like... Funny. Yeah, all the shield lampooning stuff still holds up. And like most of the comic lampooning stuff still holds up too for me of like the the ultimates parody that we talked about before and like yeah. even like the normal hey, you're supposed to be like a superhero and you're not. Like it kinda holds up. I also kinda hate it. It depends on the joke specific joke. Sure. I liked when Machine Man was getting told he's just he sort of sucks by the Eternals. The Celestials, yeah. It's, oh yeah, sorry, the Celestials. <laughs> no worries. Just made, just made me laugh. And I didn't realize that was actually a reference to uh, who's the robot in Marvel? Yeah. The robot Matthew. in Marvel? <laughs> Marvel. Yeah. Vision? Vision, yeah. Oh. It's a reference to a scene in Vision where Vision's like kind of look at me. I, a robot crying or something oh. like that. Actually, oh, yeah. Yeah, oh that's Lord. Right. <laughs> you mean a robot can cry. A robot can cry, yeah. Yeah, that's the whole thing. See, that's what I mean. You're a bitch. <laughs> this is exactly the kind of shit I'm talking about, Eric. <laughs> that's so funny. Yeah, so I mean, I think for me, like, the stuff that holds up is the over-the-top wacky stuff, Um, in addition to some of the parody stuff we were talking about. Like, when Dirk Anger in issue one is like, connect me to the overnamed communication yes. device and then it's just a giant, giant telephone, telephone that gets plugged into his head or whatever it's like oh that's so good like all those like dirk anger prop bits like when he's doing russian roulette with the giant gun that's like got the barrel that comes around and points at him like what is another reference i guess i guess nick fury had a giant gun i mean that sounds correct to me honestly that sounds like a thing jack kirby well, might draw <laughs> Now I'm like, because I don't get most of these references because I haven't been reading comics for the last 20 years, which is, I think, what you need to have as a frame of reference for some of them. But like, no, some of these are older that, than that, honestly. <laughs> I thought it was just dipping into absurdism in ways that I liked, like why he, Durginger was a zombie. I guess that was a thing, but I was just like, oh, he's just a zombie. Okay. Or like, why reveal the Modoc baby thing just for it to get shot by a dinosaur? <laughs> like, what? Yeah, I agree, actually. The absurdism, like, the, the over-the-top wacky stuff is the stuff that still really holds up and made me laugh the most on the reread, for sure. Yeah, and I like, like, 
very rarely in comics that I've seen anyway, is the bad guy what it should be, which is a corporation, just like the <laughs> real world's villains. That's actually why I really like that the Beyond Corporation still shows up in comics, actually, because you just get to be like, oh, it's this evil corporation and like heroes get to fight them. And it's like, you, you have there's no qualms here, baby. Just like heroes versus evil corporations. That's what superhero comics should be. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, they should be like lawyers and stuff. Oh, and and those final fight panels when they're clearing out the 51st state. Like, oh my god, those were so fun. It was just all these random <laughs> splash pages of weird animals and stuff. Yeah, Probably that's one... in-jokes in there too, but that was awesome. That's one where I'm like, oh, Stuart Eminem should, like, is getting the unfair end of the stick because this, co- like, this comic is <laughs> attributed to Warren Ellis. Cause, Did like, Stuart Eminem also do all the different breakout arts in, when they're in like the parallel universes and they each have their own little mini thing with different art styles? Yeah, I believe so because there's no wow. other artist credited. And like all of, most of those are actually like after another artist's style, I believe, too, which I can't name all of them, but I know the <laughs> Elsa Bloodstone one is like uh, Hellboy Mike Mignon style art so mm, yeah oh man seeing that original panel that's basically like remade shot for shot that's really funny <laughs> see this is the shit i'm talking about <laughs> <laughs> i think i had the comic where the vision does the even an android can cry bit actually but i think i got rid of that one when we were moving <laughs> god how tedious <laughs> it's a little bit but i mean it's also like it's all soap opera baby like I, my grandma loved soap operas. My mom loved soap operas. I love soap operas that they just all dress in primary colors and punch each other too in mind. So, genetics, heck of a thing. Oh God, this is all from a review from Goodreads, and someone's pulled some really good, <laughs> really good images. The part where he's a cop, Aaron, and they start oh, kicking. Yeah. Him again. That that bit actually, I think, is <laughs> not not only holds up. I think it might be better. It than got better. It one. got better. <laughs> yeah. Where they just are like, oh, he's a cop. Kick him. <laughs> what are you doing? This guy's a cop. <laughs> um, that was hilarious. <laughs> yeah, I guess it's like, as far as like a, a firm verdict on has the comedy held up or not, I think enough of it, yes, that I still consider the comic good. But like a lot of the frat boy snarky people are being mean to each other stuff, I've just got no time for anymore. And I think it does actually detract from the book, even separating it from the fact that that then reminds me about the fact that Warren Ellis is a creep in a lot of situations. Because there's no, there's, you guys can tell me if I'm wrong, there's literally no good male character in this comic all of them are shitheads. Hey, there's yes? no good female characters either. They're just all shitheads. It's I mean, it's, I think that the females are less shitty, though. Like That is <laughs> sexist. No, they're not. That I don't is know, bullshit. Man. I don't, like, no... None Elsa of the... Bloodstone is a real big asshole. Yeah, but, like, no one's, like... None of them are trying to... Oh, I don't know. None of them dude, are. Oh, you are seeing what you want to see there. I, I, I mean, the closest I'll, I'll is Monica Rambo, one, but she she sort of gives up halfway through. <laughs> I mean, so. Monica does fry a dog with her microwave power. So she's a child. Dude, it was one of those yappy little dogs. That doesn't shut the hell up. I understand. Which I don't think I she had powers when she was a child, but whatever. It's yeah, fine. Yeah, Continu- yeah. Continuity be damned. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to say, I think it was canceled, but it was a self-contained story. And I appreciate that. That's what I gravitate to. Like, if this was, I don't know, a seven-volume collection, nah. But the fact that it's one, it's like, yeah, that's not much of a commitment. I'm about that. I mean, the only reason it's only one is because they got canceled. Cat, it would have gone on. I don't care. You know what? A lot of things have gotten canceled, and, like, maybe that's for the best. Like, Firefly, get it's got its movie, and it never got bad. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, I do like the conceit of this, too, where, like, if it had kept going forever, like, it's two-issue stories, so, like, it's never going to be a weird, decompressed six-part story. It's, like, you start it, you stop it, that's the story. I like that a lot. Like, you jump in, you jump out. so far you can go when you're like, I refuse to have character development. There is that, too, right? (laughs) But, like, there... I mean, the series could have continued with that same conceit for a long time at this... Like, in the same vein, right? Like... Basically, you just have to find interesting problems to put them in front of them and then put them in front of it. And as much as it's like there's no character development, there's actually like a solid amount of character like beats in the story. They're just not really like the main focus. 
Yeah, I agree. I think I'm on the same page as you guys. It's it still has its funny moments. It's just not doesn't strike the same chord that it used to. I don't know if I would recommend this to people anymore. I would have definitely before. Yeah, I mean, I have. I have recommended it to people. I think I recommended it to you, Pat. So. You did. Well, look what you've done. What <laughs> have you brought? Yeah, I guess, Kat, Kat, you were talking about at the start, like, part, part of the reason we're even reading this book is to see if it if it held up, because you're re-examining so many things you've read or watched or listened to in the past. So, what's, what's your verdict? Some things. Ish. Eh. Like, if I don't read it for another 10 or 20 or 30 or ever years, that would be fine, too. Do I regret having read it? No. No. I mean, I like, I, again, like, I laughed at a lot of the funny bits still, so I am glad we read it. wasn't I as funny to me as it was the first time. But, yes. So I would give it like a three out of ten of holding up. I must have just been really immature the first time I read it. I don't know. That doesn't sound like you. <laughs> no, it sounds like me. <laughs> so I guess that can jump us into my question, which is a, a slightly lighter one uh, and probably won't take as much time to discuss because I figured we'd have a, a big ball of discussion in those first two questions. Um, but the discussion we had for the first two questions does influence my answer for this one, which is... Which next wave member is your favorite and why? My member is predictable. <laughs> Do you guys want to guess who it is? Monica um, Rambo. Yeah. I was gonna say not. Machine Man, but is it oh, Monica? Oh really? What? No, it's Monica, yeah. <laughs> it wasn't gonna be a guy. He's decided the women are better somehow. And I oh, guess right. I still think they are. I, character is I don't have the Monica. book in front of me to prove my point. <laughs> but I, I I do wanna say that the women are slightly less shitty. They All shitty. Aren't. Okay, that's fine. I'll just <laughs> take the point. But yeah, Monica, I think, is probably, like, the most morally upright of them, although her morals also just, like, fluctuate based on whether she thinks the thing is human or not, so that's not great. <laughs> like, killing? Yeah. Uh, they're broccoli, it's fine. Uh, killing? Yeah, they, uh, shot me, so I'm gonna kill them, so it's okay. Like, not great, but, like, I think the fact that she's the most, like, straightforward... I think the least shitty overall of the bunch to the, like, because she's a professional, she, like, wants to work together well in a team, so she's, like, the least shitty <laughs> to the rest of the group. Um, so I think that's probably why Monica is my favorite. Plus, you know, I just like my my leader types, your Nightwings, your Leonardos, etc. <laughs> your Cyclopses. Boo. Your cy- Cyclopses, yeah. Boo. Yeah. So that's my take. Uh, I think mine is probably Elsa. Also Bloodstone. That was my guess. <laughs> I was like, 100% I could guess who Pats is, and I couldn't 100% guess who Cats was. I mean, why did you guess that? How'd like, you know? Have, type, there haven't man. done a few like role-play games. You do like the, the sassy lady-in-charge characters. She kicks butt and she knows it. It's great. Okay. Yeah, the the, the sassy tough fighter lady. Yeah, uh, that's that's the pat that's uh, the Patrick Fitzgerald <laughs> flex special when you're when you role play. Fine, fine. You know me so well. <laughs> the sassy take no nonsense. Yeah, I was kind of torn between Elsa for my favorite and Aaron. Yeah, Tabby was okay. Monica's okay. The captain. Nah. <laughs> The captain's just <laughs> the worst, right? He's just, if we I mean, all... he's not the worst. He's just kind of like gross. Yeah. I don't really like potty humor sorts of things. And he's just like this gross farty guy that punches aliens. <laughs> I'm like, nah. Yeah, he's okay. He did, I don't dislike him. with that toilet cleaning brush to Dormammu's brother or whatever yeah, that I don't no. want to know about. <laughs> Ew. Did you guys catch that in the first issue of that story? They call that der- dimension that that guy comes from the dank the dimension. The dank dimension. And in no. the next issue, they call it the dim dimension. And I think the Marvel editors, like multiple times in this series, like caught wind of what was going on. And we're like, you can't do that, guys. <laughs> <laughs> you can't do that. It's a different dimension. It's fine. <laughs> All right. Well, I think that actually brings us to the end of our discussion and to the recommendations section. Bum, bum, bum. So, what would you guys recommend to someone who read this and liked it? <laughs> After having dis- discussed whether or not you say, should like this. Maybe <laughs> maybe something girls. by someone who hasn't been cancelled yet. <laughs> I don't know. It's up to you. Again, we had that discussion. <laughs> uh, Kat, you got something? Otherwise, I can jump in. I uh, can't really think of comic books with my limited... 
I thought this had s- of comic books. similar flavors to uh, Atomic Robo. Yeah, a little bit. Yeah. The uh, funny writing in the... I would say the thing that it makes me think of is like, go check out frat boy humor dude flicks from like 2003 through 2010. Like old school is the thing I was thinking of with Will Ferrell. That, this one has old school vibes. Or super bad, or forty year old virgin. Those are kind sure. of on the same level, I think. I wonder how many of those still hold up. Also, not <laughs> many. Did you ever watch the forty year old virgin? Nah. I like that it catapulted Steve Carell to stardom, but I'm good on it. I think I tried to watch Super Bad as an adult <gasps> yeah! once, and it didn't go great. I was there. <laughs> we tried to watch Super Bad too, and it was okay. Oh, I guess that means old school won't hold up. I remember liking that one. I think I've only seen that once, and I don't remember much about it, so I can't say on that one. (laughs) (laughs) Well, Will Ferrell's in it. It might still be good. Yeah. Pat, do you want to go? (laughs) Uh, Yeah, so my pick is an Image comic series. Uh, It's by Hickman and Batara. It's called... The Manhattan Projects. It's similar in its wackiness and irreverent like humor. It's more serious. It's how would you describe this, Matt? You've read it, right? Manhattan Projects. That's one of the haven't really books I haven't read. It's interesting. It's an alternate history uh, where the the Manhattan Projects like it's uncontrolled science. Like government has just given away everything to science and it's run amok and it's basically just following what that leads to. Like, I think one of the primary characters is Albert Einstein and I don't know. It's fun. It's been a while since I've read it. It's the real world, except it's science instead of tech. Yeah, sort of. It's been a while since I've read it, but it's, it's a wacky ride and the art is interesting. It reminds me a little bit of Frank Quitely's art where it's got like super detail and all the characters. I don't know. Did it end? <laughs> Did it finish? <laughs> that I don't know. I have the first three volumes. I can't okay. tell you for sure if it has an ending. I feel like part of the reason I didn't jump on that one is I, it, I'm not sure it actually has an ending or not, but uh, we might, I don't know. You find out, reader. You'll figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> Listener, mm. God. Reader, I married him. <laughs> reader, I married her. Um, yeah, my... I have and so it's good. My recommendation is also like a wild comic book. It's not as funny, but it is very over the top. And it kind of just asks you to go with it. And like, it's got sort of the same absurdist vein in a way of just like bigger and bigger and bigger things happen. And it kind of just asks you to come along for the ride. And it's Transformers versus G.I. Joe, which I don't really have an investment in either of those properties. Like, so... You can take that for what you will, but like I really love that comic book because it's just like it goes so hard. The conceit is that the Transformers show up on Earth and it's an Earth where G.I. Joe exists. So like G.I. Joe and the Autobots eventually like end up teaming up to fight the Decepticons. And as part of that, really weird shit happens. And just like I think eventually Earth becomes a Transformer. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, so the, that's that's as hard as it goes, essentially. Um, so that that's a good one. It's worth picking up if you like the bits of this that are over-the-top nonsense. All right, guys. Well, I think we did have a good discussion about this comic book that I wasn't sure I wanted to read. Do <laughs> um, you regret think... re- having read it? No, I don't, actually. I'm actually really glad we read it. I'm glad you picked it. Cause, like, it was still a... fun, right? Yeah, it was still fun, and I think we had a really good conversation about it, and it's a conversation that, like, you and I have been having, like, on and off, I think, since that pandemic summer where so many shitty people were outed, and it was good to have it, like, in a, like, a well-defined space and kind of draw some actual conclusions, like, having, like, having the whole conversation at once. It was also nice to have Pat (laughs) tell, tell us what he thought at the same time, so... It wasn't just the same discussion we've been having, so that was nice. But yeah, and the comic itself still good. Like Stuart Eminem's art, like still really good. Like there's that scene where I think it's Elsa knocks the engine out of a car, and Stuart Eminem draws like every single part of a car engine semi accurately. Like I, 
It's so good. Like I think they're doing a web comic called Grass of Parnassus right now. Him and his wife, and you should probably go check that out if you like this too. I guess a bonus recommendation. But if you want to get in touch with Pat or myself uh, as a result of the discussion of this podcast, you can email us at waitingonthetrade at gmail.com. You can also find more comics-related goodness, including blog posts and other such things, at mattreadscomics.com, where every once in a while Kat does a guest post if she's willing to grace us with her presence. They're always very good. Um, Kat, do you have anywhere on the internet that you want people to find you at this point, or have you joined the rest of us <laughs> in shutting the online life? <laughs> uh, I don't really have anything going on. Maybe someday. No. Right. Well, thank you for coming back on the podcast. I always appreciate when you humor me <laughs> and bring a book and an excellent discussion to the podcast. Well, thank you. Thank <laughs> you.